Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. So this is the second video I'll be going over for part four of our book. The first video I made was about Friedrich Nietzsche's, uh, the last section of his book, Beyond Good and Evil. And now I'm moving to Grace Clement, The Ideal Types of Care and Justice. And the reason I started with these last two essays of part four of our book, so the last two essays of the whole book, is because the discussion, the final discussion forum, discussion four, asks you to compare Nietzsche's concepts of slave morality and master morality with Clement's analysis of the concepts of the ethic of care and the ethic of justice. How are they different from each other? How are they similar? So I realize you've got your initial post due on Tuesday by midnight or 11.59 p.m. Tuesday evening. So you'll need this information to help you make uh, a good initial post. All right, so just keep in mind Nietzsche's ideas of master morality and slave morality. Richard Bilsker does not ask you to compare the two in the discussion questions but I will compare them as we go through here. But first, uh, let me just summarize, go over this argument by Grace Clement. So she's commenting on an older dialogue that had been going on uh, since um, two Harvard psychologists, Carol Gilligan and Lawrence Kohlberg, had a debate, uh, Kohlberg created this model of the steps of moral development of children and how, how they acquired concepts like space-time, number, geometry, and causality. That was an earlier study. Uh, and then Kohlberg, so I'm just reading here from, from Richard Bilsker's summary on page 569. Kohlberg deter determined his 1958 doctoral dissertation that there are six stages of moral development. So then Carol Gilligan's book noted that in numerous tests, which asked young people to give their responses to moral dilemmas, girls scored lower on Kohlberg's scale than boys did. So Gilligan then said, it's not that the girls ha are less moral, it's that they are looking at the moral dilemma through a different perspective or speaking about it through uh, with a different voice. And so that gave rise to this concept of two different types of ethics, the ethic of justice, which boys would tend to adhere to, and the ethic of care, which is how the girls were looking at things, according to Carol Gilligan and the debate as it developed after that initial debate between Kohlberg and Gilligan. So this is Grace Clement, and she wrote this article um, in 1996, and it is the University um, of Maryland, or what is it, the Associate Professor of Philosophy at Salisbury University in Maryland, so close to us, down in the College of Southern Maryland. So I will um, read up at the top of page 570. It's a very good summary of the whole debate, the top paragraph. So page 570. The most important feature of the ideal types of care and justice is that the two ethics are defined as alternatives to one another. They are understood as conflicting ethics, each with its own ontology, method, and priorities committed to mutually exclusive values and best suited to different kinds of situations. The two ethics are generally distinguished in three ways. The ethic of justice takes an abstract approach, while the ethic of care takes a contextual approach. Two, the ethic of justice begins with an assumption of human separateness, while the ethic of care begins with an assumption of human connectedness. And three, the ethic of justice has some form of equality as a priority, while the ethic of care has the maintenance of relationships as a priority. These features, in turn, are generally taken to result in conflicting evaluations of autonomy 
in a division of labor between the two ethics along public private lines. So that is a very good summary of what she's going to argue for the rest of the article. She spells it all out there nicely and neatly. Um, so just keep in mind the ethic of care and the ethic of justice, how they perceive the world, and we'll be comparing it to the worldviews of master morality and slave morality that Nietzsche discussed in Beyond Good and Evil. But let me describe this, the Heinz dilemma, which was the the mental model that um, both Kohlberg and Gilligan used when they were creating their theories about these different types of ethics. Or Gill Kohlberg was just making a theory about ethics in general, which he was applying to boys and girls without differentiating between them. And Gilligan pointed out, the girls are scoring lower on your test because your test is geared towards the way boys think, which they identify with the ethic of justice. So here's the Heinz dilemma. In Europe, a woman was near death from cancer. This is on page 570. One drug might save her, a rare form of radium that a druggist in the same town had discovered. The druggist was charging $2,000, 10 times what the drug cost him to make. So the sick woman's husband tried to get the money. He couldn't gather it. He couldn't borrow it. He asked the druggist, can I give you what I've got now, pay you later so I can save my wife's life. And the druggist said no. So the husband broke into the, the, um, the shop, the drugstore, and tried to steal the drug, the radium, for his dying wife. So this is what Grace Clemens says about, so both Lawrence Kohlberg and Carol Gilligan used this hypothetical situation to elicit individual styles and levels of moral reasoning. Gilligan discerned in subjects' responses to this dilemma features of the ethic of care and the ethic of justice that have become the basis, the bases of the ideal types of the two ethics. So the first standard distinction drawn between the two moral orientations is their relative abstractness or concreteness. So the ethic of justice wants to abstract from the details. So reduce the situation to some common fundamental universal moral principles that it can apply equally to everyone in any given situation. That's justice. So what's going on here? Well, you've got the druggist's right to his property, but you've got the dying woman's right to life, and you're weighing these, which is more important, if you're analyzing the situation from the ethic of justice perspective, you could easily say that the man was wrong for robbing the druggist or that the druggist was wrong for withholding the drug from the dying woman. But in either case, you're thinking of the situation by abstracting from the details. It doesn't really matter who Heinz was, what his relationship to the druggist was, what kind of a marriage he had, all those principles will only fog up the issue. What you're trying to do is what's the general rule that would apply equally to anybody in a similar situation where it's this right to property versus a right to life, which one has priority in this situation. Whereas the ethic of care takes the context as the most important thing. And there's not enough detail in the story as it's given. There's no details given about the relationship between the husband and the wife. There's no indication of why the druggist was charging 10 times more. What maybe he had, you know, who knows if, if he had children to feed and bills to pay. And so there's more from the ethic of care's perspective, more detail is needed because the priority there is maintaining relationships. That's the ethic of care's goal, to maintain healthy relationships between people, whereas the ethic of justice prioritizes the autonomous individual's rights, and specifically this, this equal rights, that every individual, regardless of the, who they are, we all have certain universal inalienable rights. And it doesn't matter about our relationships with each other, or our different situations in life that we, we can abstract away from those. And the ethic of care says, 
Is it really possible to abstract away from the concrete reality in which we live? Um, that's, that's a dubious proposal, this whole idea of the autonomous individual. It might not even really exist. So, all right, so I'm going to now just read through sections um, where she develops that intro paragraph on page 570. On, so the bottom half of page 570, she says, The first standard distinction drawn between the two moral orientations is the relative abstractness or concreteness. The primary focus of an ethic of justice is a set of abstract principles. In order to act justly in a particular situation, we must abstract from the particular features of that situation to see how it comes under a general rule. For instance, we must abstract from individuals' distinguishing features. As Sela Ben Habib puts it, this requires taking the standpoint of the generalized other, in which we abstract from the individuality and concrete identity of the other, because moral dignity is based on what we have in common, not in what differentiates us, says Ben Habib. In contrast, the ethic of care has its primary focus has as its primary focus the unique and particular features of a situation. For example, rather than abstracting from a person's individuating features using the ethic of care, we make moral decisions on the basis of these features. In Ben Habib's language, we take the standpoint of the concrete other. We view every individual as an individual with a concrete history, identity, and effective emotional constitution. All right, so... Um, if you look on page 571, just about halfway down the page in that second to last paragraph, Clement says, allied to this abstract concrete distinction is a distinction between reason and emotion. So abstract, ethic of justice, concrete, ethic of care. Allied to that distinction is one between reason and emotion. So the ethic of justice prioritizes reason over emotion and abstracting from the particular relationships involved, whereas the ethic of care very consciously says, no, those concrete relationships are what are most important, and it's not what your reason may tell you, it's what your emotions tell you should be done. So you should keep in mind that this public-private distinction between when it's appropriate to use the ethic of justice and the ethic of care. That is part of the argument that goes on. So neither one of these should be dispensed with. It's just when do you use which ethical perspective in what situation? And what Grace Clement will, will agree with is that the ethic of care is appropriate when people actually know each other, such as in families. You don't want a general rule. You're going to adjust everything to the individuals in the family. If a three-year-old smashes a vase, you're not going to scream at the three-year-old. But if a teenager is angry at his parents and he smashes a vase, well, that's a whole other story because, oh yeah, well, one, you should treat both children equally. No, you have to take into account, I mean, and that's not a good example because even the ethic of justice would say that's an important detail about the relative rational abilities, but, um, you know, in a family situation, you take into account the whole historical context of each individual and their relationships with each other, because everyone is aware of it in the family. That wouldn't be appropriate in the, in the public sphere. In the public sphere, you're supposed to not be biased and just think of people abstractly as individual citizens with rights. That's what she's going to say. You need both it would be inappropriate to use either in its in the sphere of the other. Um, all right, so continuing here, this abstract concrete distinction is allied with this, re this reason and emotion distinction. From the justice perspective, feelings are seen as threatening the universality demanded of moral judgment. And thus we should seek to abstract from our particular feelings and focus on universal principles to be properly moral. As its extreme, in Kant's ethics, an action motivated by feelings, however right it is, has no moral worth. In contrast, from a care perspective, feelings are regarded as morally central. All right, so Kant's ethics. We haven't read Kant's ethics yet, 
Now that came earlier in part four of the book, but as I explained, I started with these last two because of the discussion forum about comparing Nietzsche and Clement. Um, so I will go back and make a video on Kant later, but we'll pick up enough of what she's saying here to understand what you need for the discussion forum. So, uh, so the second distinction between the ethic of care and the ethic of justice, the bottom of page 571, the second standard distinction between the ethic of justice and the ethic of care is based on their different conceptions of the self. The ethic of justice begins with an assumption of human separateness so that in order to be obligated to others, we must in some sense consent to these obligations. Thus, the ethic of justice emphasizes notions of choice and will in understanding our moral obligations. In contrast, the ethic of care begins with an assumption of human connectedness, the result of which is that to a large extent we recognize rather than choose our obligations to others. In other words, the ethic of justice takes freedom as its starting point, while the ethic of, of care takes obligation as its starting point. So, this means that the general challenge of the ethic of justice is to show how one's obligations to others arise without violating one's individual autonomy, while the general challenge of the ethic of care is to show how one can achieve individual freedom without violating one's moral obligations to others. All right, that... Um, the different conceptions of the self. The ethic of care, when I was reading this, so every time I give this, these classes and des describe these essays, I read them again because they're complicated enough that you need to get back into the details every time. You know, three or four months will pass, you'll need to read it again. This time through, I was thinking of a comparison of the Hindu concepts of Atman and Brahman that we read about in the Katha Upanishad, and uh, we'll discuss it again in the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita, which is the first essay for this fourth part of the book. That's the video I'll do after this one. I'll start back at the beginning of part four of the book. But just to get back on topic here, the ethic of justice has the individual, the autonomous individual, endowed with rights by, by this universal principle. That's similar to the Hindu concept of Atman, an individual particular self. And then the idea of connectedness and relationship is the fundamental reality with even being skeptical of the existence of an autonomous individual self. That's the ethic of care. That's more like the concept of Brahman, every, the undifferentiated, homogeneous, all-encompassing opposite side of Atman. The, all, the absolute truth for the Hindus is the union of Atman and Brahman. And similarly here we'll see it's the union of the ethic of justice and the ethic of care along the lines of the public-private distinction that um, Grace Clement and others are recommending So this is also related to the master morality and slave morality. And as Nietzsche said, these two moralities are most often confused in people who don't even know that they're confusing the two and that the goal of higher civilizations is to unite them harmoniously. And then he'll talk about, you know, the ideal types of master morality and slave morality. So I'm going to be comparing them but just keep in mind these individual elements of Grace Clement's argument, because I think it would be fair to say in a rough way that if you wanted to compare the ethic of justice and the ethic of care to the left-wing, right-wing, Republican, they're called, and Democrat in the United States, the left-wing, right-wing is, right-wing is Republicans, left-wing is Democrats. I think most people would say that the Democrats would side more with the ethic of care and the Republicans more with the ethic of justice, although both sides could be easily accused of using the inappropriate ethic, for example, as we'll see here, um, using the ethic of care in the public sphere is just nepotism and cronyism. That's caring only for the people that you know 
while you're in the public sphere. So using public funds to enrich your friends, that's using the ethic of care in the public sphere. That's not just. Um, but then in the ethic of care and associating that roughly with the Democratic Party, and yet you'll see that the ethic of justice is emphasis is on equality and um, individual autonomy, and that's also big issues for the Democratic Party. So you see how they get mixed together, and I, I would say it's, they get mixed together in the way Nietzsche talked about, um, and I'll just read that. It's, I think, one of the most important passages in Beyond Good and Evil, page 549. I'll just read this because we're going we're gonna to start to compare the two. And a tour through the many finer and coarser moralities which have hitherto prevailed or still prevail on the earth, I found certain traits recurring regularly together and connected with one another until finally two primary types revealed themselves to me and a radical distinction was brought to light. There is master morality and slave morality. I would at once add, however, that in all higher and mixed civilizations, there are also attempts at the reconciliation of the two moralities, but one finds still oftener the confusion and mutual misunderstanding of them, indeed sometimes their close juxtaposition, even in the same man within one's soul. All right, so I think you'll see in the political divide between left and right a kind of a confused combination of the ethic of justice and the ethic of care, which can't be directly equated with the slave morality and master morality, although there's a lot of overlap between those two concepts. Um, and when I do get to that uh, public-private distinction between the ethic of justice and the ethic of care, I'll go back and talk about Nietzsche's descriptions of the uh, master morality and slave morality. So, um, but continuing here, on page 572, the bottom paragraph, she says, Grace Clement, this brings me to the third standard distinction between the ethic of care and the ethic of justice, the distinction between their priorities. The ethic of care has two interrelated priorities, maintaining one's relationships and meeting the needs of those to whom one is connected. In contrast, the ethic of justice takes some form of equality as a priority, to be sure, Equality is interpreted in different ways in different theories of justice, for example. For example, a libertarian would argue for the equal right to use one's resources as one chooses. A socialist would argue for the equal right to have one's basic needs met. An Aristotelian would argue for returns in proportion to contributions. Libertarians focus on a set of negative rights, socialists on a set of positive rights, and Aristotelians not on rights but duties still all derive these truths from the same conception of equality. Um, so if you were applying it to the Heinz dilemma, Heinz and the druggist have equal rights to their property. So a libertarian might say it was wrong for Heinz to steal the drug from the druggist. The drug has no obligation to take care of your wife. That's not his problem. He does have a right to his own property and you violated it, so you broke the law. Whereas a, a socialist would say, um, that druggist had no right to withhold vital medical care from that woman. Um, you know, his, his right to property is superseded by this other woman's right to life. And so that, that's how she analyzes that. The variations of the ethic of justice and its prioritizing of equality. It can be interpreted in different ways, libertarian in a socialist way, but still there's this concept of an autonomous individual with equal rights. And the emphasis is not on relationships with people. Um, so the second paragraph on page 573, she says, So far as I have discussed three ways in which the ethic of justice and the ethic of care are usually distinguished, these three distinctions are generally thought to justify two further differences. Uh, first, while the ethic of justice is understood to take the concept of autonomy as central, the ethic of care is understood to be opposed to the concept of autonomy, 
on the grounds that it is excessively individualistic. Second, it is typically held that the ethic of justice applies to the public sphere of politics and civil society, while the ethic of care applies to the private sphere of family and friends. So, um, the next paragraph, the last sentence, she says, Thus, an autonomous individual is self-defining, choosing projects and life plans without the interference of outside influences or other people. Autonomous actions are ones that can be said to be truly the agent's own. So that's the ethic of justice. And that is similar to Nietzsche's concept of master morality. So if you look on page 549, the last few sentences, he says, the noble type of man regards himself as a determiner of values. He does not require to be approved of. He passes the judgment. What is injurious to me is injurious in itself. That's a quote. He knows that it is he himself only who confers honor on things. He is a creator of values. He honors whatever he recognizes in himself. Such morality equals self-glorification. So, that right there is really a mixture of the ethic of justice and the ethic of care. It's like the ethic of justice in that it emphasizes the autonomous individual as self-defining. That's the master. And yet, the ethic of justice is supposed to be based on universal principles that apply equally to everyone. That is not master morality. If you look over at the bottom paragraph of page 548, Nietzsche says, to refrain mutually from injury, from violence, from exploitation, and put one's will on a par with that of others, this may result, in a certain rough sense, in a good conduct among individuals, when the necessary conditions are given, namely the actual similarity of the individuals in amount of force and degree of worth, and their correlation within one organization. As soon, however, as one wished to take this principle more generally, and if possible even as the fundamental principle of society, it would immediately disclose what it really is, namely a will to the denial of life, a principle of disillusion and decay. Here one must think profoundly to the very basis and resist all sentimental weakness. Life itself is essentially appropriation, injury, conquest of the strange and weak, suppression, severity, obtrusion of peculiar forms, incorporation, and at the least, putting it mildly, exploitation. But why should one forever use precisely these words on which for ages a disparaging purpose has been stamped? Even the organization within which, as was previously supposed, the individuals treat each other as equal, it takes place in every healthy aristocracy, must itself, if it be a living and not a dying organization, do all that towards other bodies which the individuals within it refrain from doing to each other. And it will have to be the incarnated will to power. It will endeavor to grow, to gain ground, attract to itself, and acquire ascendancy, not owing to any, not owing to any morality or immorality, but because it lives and because life is precisely will to power. So, that is an important paragraph to take into account for discussion forum four when you're comparing and contrasting master morality and slave morality with the ethic of justice and the ethic of care. So here we saw that master morality is like the ethic of justice in the sense that it praises the autonomous individual who creates um, who's a self-defining autonomous individual. That's the second to last paragraph on 573. That's the ethic of justice. Whereas the bottom of 549, the master sees himself as the creator of values. But these values, as I said before, are not based on any kind of a universal principle, which Immanuel Kant said morals should be based on. Abstract from all the concrete particular details of our messy biological lives on earth and reduce everything to these fundamental universal laws, then that's morality, says Kant. And these laws apply equally to everyone in the universe. 
Nietzsche specifically said that that kind of an attitude is decay. And he, he identifies that with slave morality. So you see how slave morality has one of the fundamental aspects of the ethic of justice. It wants equality. And Nietzsche will say, of course, slaves want equality because they're at the bottom. They're, they, they'd be happy with just, you don't be above me and I won't be above you. We'll all be equal. Whereas the master is always looking down and using people as a means towards the purpose of not even himself as an individual always, but his group, his aristocratic group. Um, and that Nietzsche says, that's just life. That's the essence of life, which he also calls the will to power. And it would be sentimental weakness to think that you could have some fundamental universal law of equality because that's not reality. Strangely, that is what the ethic of care is associated with by Grace Clement. It's not that it's advocating to go out and crush people, but it is saying that all people aren't really equal. It's determined by the context of the relationships and the people that you know, you're going to have more care for them. They're not, you're not going to have an equal amount of care for someone else's baby as your own. That's just natural. And that's going to lead to a, a dilemma, which is one of the discussion questions for Grace Clement, um, when she discusses Nell Noddings. But, um, all right, you know what, I'll just go to that right now. So we'll come back to the master morality, slave morality comparison here. Um, but... The bottom paragraph on page 574, the, I'll just read here, Grace Clement says, First, the contextuality of care seems to limit it to situations about which we can know extensive details. We do not know the details of the lives of individuals on the other side of the world, so it would seem impossible for us to care for them. Nell Noddings argues that this is the case. She holds that the contextuality of care means that caring requires real encounters with and responses from individuals. Thus, we cannot care for starving children in Africa if we don't know them, and we cannot care for all humankind. This is a quote from Noddings. Caring itself is reduced to mere talk about caring when we attempt to do so, meaning when we attempt to care for people that we just don't know. According to Noddings, real caring requires that we not just care about but care for. And this is her quote. Um, caring is not simply a matter of feeling favorably disposed toward humankind in general, of being concerned about people with whom we have no concrete connections. There is a fundamental difference between the kind of care a mother has for her child and the kind of care a well-fed American adult has for a starving Somali child she, he has never met. Real care requires actual encounters with specific individuals. So then Grace Clement points out, well, then what are you saying? We have no moral obligation to care for people who are starving to death across the world? And then Noddings said, no, I'm not suggesting that, but I um, don't know exactly how we could ethically justify caring for them, which is ironic use of the word justify because she's proposing that the ethic of care is superior to and should be used instead of the ethic of justice. She was trying to say the ethic of justice is not is not a worthwhile theory, but then later she stepped back from that position and she says, well, yeah, I, uh, I think maybe the ethic of justice probably is useful. I'm just not prepared at present to say how it could be so. And then uh, Grace Clemens said, um, Noddings may not, this is the bottom of page 575, Noddings may not be willing to draw the obvious conclusion, but others are. If care is restricted to personal relationships, then all moral obligations beyond personal relations must be based on justice. John Broughton defends Kohlberg against advocates of the ethic of care in writing that justice is intended as the abstract form that caring takes when respect is maintained and responsibility assumed for people whom one does not know personally and may never come to know. Um, okay, so 
I'm going to read this next paragraph just to show you how the, these two types of ethics start to twist into each other. It's kind of like the Taoist symbol of the yin yang, the, the two swirls, one dark, one white, each with the circle of the other in its, in its center. It's the same way that Nietzsche describes master morality and slave morality. He doesn't say he's doing it, but if you just carefully read paragraph after paragraph, it doesn't take long before he's using the same adjectives to describe slave morality that he formerly used to describe master morality. Uh, so I'll read the second paragraph. Thus it has been argued, this is page 576, second paragraph. Thus it has been argued that the first feature of care I have emphasized, its contextuality, requires that care be a personal ethic. Again, this argument holds that because it is impossible to take a contextual perspective in non-personal contexts, we must take an abstract perspective. The second feature of care is also thought to rule out the possibility of the ethic of care in non-personal contexts. The ethic of care presupposes the ontological view that the self is socially constituted or defined through its relationship to others. So this is the irony here. Grace Clement is calling the ethic of care personal, a personal ethic, because you're concerned with people that you know, and she, which implies the ethic of justice is non-personal. However, she'll go on to say that the ethic of care thinks the self is socially constituted or defined through its relationship to others. We saw others say that. We saw Mead say that. The self is a social construct. It does not believe in an autonomous individual soul. So another way of saying that is the ethic of justice does believe in persons if you define person as a self. It believes in an individual autonomous self. Whereas the ethic of care says, no, there's no individual self. Self comes into being through relationships in society. That's why it emphasizes the relationships between people. So to say that the ethic of care is personal and the ethic of justice is non-personal, it makes sense from one perspective. From, but from the other perspective, you would say the ethic of care inclines towards the Buddhist perspective that there is no individual self, whereas the ethic of justice inclines towards the Hindu platonic perspective, which Descartes shared, that all of us are eternal individual selves, Atman. And that's what I talked about at the beginning of this video, the Atman, the individual autonomous self, and the Brahman the impersonal ocean of potential being, which is also similar to the particle wave nature of the material world revealed by quantum mechanics, as I've talked about before. So it kind of, I think if you compare all these different things we've gone over in this class, each comparison can bring out an element that isn't easily seen without that kind of a comparison. Okay, so... Um, the bottom paragraph on page 576. Others have allowed that it may be possible to use an ethic of care in non-personal contexts, but have argued that it is nevertheless unjust to do so. So non-personal contexts, that means the public sphere, where you don't know every individual. In the family and among your friends, the ethic of care is appropriate because you actually do know the detailed history of each participant. But in the public sphere, when you don't know those details, it's better to revert to the ethic of justice. So, but it is possible to use the ethic of care in the public sphere, but it would be unjust. And as I pointed out before at the bottom of page 548, Nietzsche says, yeah, you might call it unjust, but that's just the will to power itself. It's the essence of life. And in fact, any healthy aristocracy does use the ethic of care. It treats its own members with respect and as equals, but everyone outside of its own sphere it sees as a means towards its own end, the end of the aristocracy in question. So, continuing on page 576, they have agreed with the above critics that the sense of social connection underlying the ethic of care is limited and have envisioned a public ethic of care based on that sense of social, connex of social connection. Such an ethic of care would express partiality towards our friends and family members. As Friedman points out, the infamous boss of Chicago's old-time Democratic machine, Mayor Richard J. Daley, was legendary for his nepotism and political partisanship. He cared extravagantly for his relatives, friends, and political cronies. 
Such critics argue that because the ethic of care involves favoritism towards those one is related to, it must be restricted to the sphere of personal relations which favor that where such favoritism is appropriate. So uh, the top of page 577, that first full paragraph, halfway down through that paragraph, she says, in other words, public versions of the ethic of care based on a sense of social connection would seem to endorse clear injustices such as racism or sexism. So, um, I think I will read one more part here. On page 577, about three quarters of the way down, she writes, Kohlberg writes that the ethic of care is, in and of itself, not well adapted to resolve problems which require principles to resolve conflicting claims among persons, all of whom in some sense should be cared about. The ethic of care asks us to meet everyone's needs, but the fact of conflicts over the division of scarce resources, which are the conflicts characteristic of the public sphere, means, not, means that not everyone's needs can be met. A comprehensive moral theory must offer us fair ways to settle such conflicts and the ethic of care with this warm, mushy, and wholly impossible politics of universal love, was a quote from Kohlberg, um, cannot do so. Or she, she quotes someone named Ferguson. At any rate, Broughton also makes this argument. A principle of help or care does not work in situations where helping one agent harms another. Even in the Heinz dilemma, this is a problem. Should Heinz care for the druggist too? Or shouldn't he care for the druggist too? According to Broughton, since it is impossible for Heinz to care for both his wife and the druggist, he must dispense with an ethic of care and make use of an ethic of justice that ranks his wife's right to life against the druggist's right to property. So, that um, is pretty much, that's the last page for Grace Clement's article. I'll look at these discussion questions, and the first one already is proposing a little bit of a problem. On page 579, Clement offers Kant as an example of an ethic of justice. Explain in what ways this is so. So we haven't gone over Kant yet in the videos. I haven't made the video about Kant yet, but the main point was that she says the ethic of justice tries to abstract from the particulars of a situation to find some universal law that applies to each individual autonomous, in, autonomous individual equally. And that our emotions should in no way influence our moral decisions, but only our reason. And the reason should conform itself to these universal concepts of moral obligation. We should act only out of respect for these universal laws, or what Kant will say, respect for the idea of law in general, which is similar to Plato's idea of the good, the, the archetypal concept of law in itself. And he'll come up with a, a method how to, you know, if we don't know what that universal law is, at least we can know what it isn't. He calls it the categorical imperative. We will get into that. Um, but I just explained how Clement compares Kant to the ethic of justice abstracting from the relationships to find universal principles that apply equally to autonomous individuals. The ethic of care is even skeptical that autonomous individuals exist. The self is emergent from social interrelations and it doesn't emphasize equality so much as relationships. Not equality of individuals, but relationships between individuals and individuals are this amorphous concept. Page 579, discussion question two. One early advocate of an ethic of care that Clement mentions is Nell Noddings. Explain the discussion of Noddings' work that occurs in Clement's chapter. So we saw that. Noddings was an, a proponent of the ethic of care and an opponent of the ethic of justice. She thought that it should be dispensed with. But then she pointed out that you can't care for people that you don't know. You cannot care for children on the other side of the world who are starving to death if you don't know them. Later, she said, well, maybe you could extend the ethic of care to care for them by these concentric spheres of care. We care for the people next to us. They care for the people next to them. Well, eventually, you're going to have people who are next to the starving children. And if everyone cares for everyone in that sphere, the care can get down to the kids who need it. And you could also pressure the people who live near them to care for them. But why should you care to pressure the people who are near them? You don't know them either. 
it had all sorts of problems. Nobody was buying it. So eventually Nell Noddings backed off of her strict dichotomy. She says, yeah, probably reducing anything to one particular answer is not right. But at this point, I'm not prepared to say what role the ethic of justice should have. Then Clement pointed out, you Nell know, Noddings isn't prepared to say, but others are. The ethic of care is appropriate when you actually do know people, and when you don't know people, the ethic of justice is appropriate. That's why the ethic of justice is appropriate in the public sphere of politics. The ethic of care is appropriate in families and among your close friends. So page 579, and that was all at the bottom of page 574, over to the bottom of page 575. So, discussion question three. Discuss Clement's consideration of Gilligan and Kohlberg in the course of the chapter. So, it begins with the discussion of Gilligan and Kohlberg. Kohlberg created a test of moral development for children, the six stages of moral development, and Gilligan noted the boys are scoring higher. Assuming that boys are not morally superior to girls, Gilligan came to the conclusion that the girls are looking at the situation which is the Heinz dilemma of the druggist and the man stealing the drug to save his wife who's dying of cancer. The girls are generally looking at that differently uh, through the ethic of care. She, it would become, that's what it came to be called, the ethic of care. And the boy's perspective generally was the ethic of justice. So that's the foundation of this whole essay. And then later um, we saw Kohlberg get mentioned again on page 577, about three quarters of the way down, Kohlberg writes that the ethic of care is in and of itself not well adapted to resolve problems which require principles to resolve conflicting claims among persons, all of whom in some sense should be cared about. So if, all right, the ethic of care, well, you should care about everybody. So then how do you decide who gets the care? Draw straws? Or what do you do? Flip a coin, and Kohlberg is saying, no, you have recourse to the ethic of justice. Use reason, these universal principles that apply equally to everybody. Um, so that's, I think, sufficient for discussion question three. Now discussion question four is another problem because it's about Hume. I haven't made the video about Hume yet, but let me just read it here and I will go over it again when I do make the video about Hume just as I will go over the question, the first discussion question about comparing Kant to the ethic of justice again when I make the Kant video. But for now, on page 580, the last discussion question of the book, some argue that Hume was an early advocate of something like an ethic of care. Is there anything in the passage we considered from Hume's ethics that might support this interpretation of Hume? Explain. Well, the main thing, which I'll go over again when I go over Hume, is that Hume says reason is and should always be the slave of passion. So Kant said we should not let our emotions influence our moral decision making at all. It should all be just a rational understanding of how our actions show respect for the universal law, the idea of moral law in general. Whereas Hume says, no, it's not reason that determines our actions and it never has been. Reason is always the servant of passion or emotion. You have a feeling in your heart and then reason will rationalize that feeling for you, help you create the means to achieve the end which your emotion desires. Um, but feeling, whether it should or shouldn't be, it just nevertheless always is the guide of our moral actions. And that is what the ethic of care says, that it's our, our emotions should have priority over our reason and our, because emotions are what's important when we have relationships. Whereas the ethic of justice is saying you shouldn't let your relationships and your emotional connections hamper your respect for universal principles that apply equally to everyone. You shouldn't allow these biases to influence you. And the ethic of care would say that's ridiculous. You can't help but let your biases, you're created by personal relationships. Um, so I will go over that discussion question again when I go over Hume, but um, I think I've given you enough now with Nietzsche and Clement for you to 
have something to say for the final discussion forum, comparing and contrasting master morality and slave morality. Uh, so read over the sections that I talked about. Uh, you should read both of these articles and use short pertinent quotes to support your opinion because, as you know, I grade on knowledge of the text. You can interpret it your own personal opinion in any way you want, so long as your opinion is based on a knowledge of what these essays are saying. Okay, so the next video will be about the first reading for part four of our book, um, and it will be the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu text, and I will pick up there.